Hi everyone, good afternoon. I'm Natalie Swachina, the Education and Residency Director at the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft. Thank you for joining us to explore two of our current resident artist studios this afternoon. We're really excited as these two artists wrap up their three month residencies at the Craft Center and are excited to share a bit about their studio process, their practice and their materials with you, the Houston community and our community also on the internet. Um, today, both of our talks will be around 20 minutes. The residents will be able to talk to you um, through a slideshow presentation, and then we'll share, um, leave some time at the end for any questions that you might have. So feel free, feel free throughout the um, afternoon to leave any questions, comments, observations you have in the Facebook chat, and we'll share those with the residents. Um, as well, I'll be um, adding in some links to some of their projects and to some other um, artists and some other groups throughout the talk as well. So thank you for joining us today. Um, we're going to get started with Carrie Ann Quick. Carrie Ann is a California craftsperson and associate professor of jewelry and metalwork at San Diego State University. Quick received her Bachelor of Arts in Applied Arts from San Diego State University and her Master of Fine Arts and Metals from the University of Illinois Arrange Champagne. Champaign. Um, she has received numerous grants, including a Kinney Fellowship and the SDSU University Projects Grant. She co-organizes and edits the zine journal Craft Desert with Professor Adam John Manley, does curatorial projects under Secret Identity Projects with Professor Jess Tolbert, and is the co-author of Craft Manifestos. Highlights from her exhibition record include those at the Museum of Art and Design in New York, the Museum Franz Mayer in Mexico City, and the National Museum for Women in the Arts in DC. Oh, sorry, <laughs> and the Salon, I just ended that too quick. And the Salon de Mobile in Milan and the Design Week in Amsterdam. Uh, her work include, is included in the collection of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, and the Netherlands Design Museum. Her re research is rooted in exploring craft practice as cultural phenomena and emphasizing that with an emphasis on jewelry and personal adornment. Here at the Craft Center, Quick has been working on a new series exploring the intimate bonds of friendship and the impact of physical separation spurred on by the pandemic. And we're really excited that Carrie's been here since December, so December, January, and February, and you have one more week to visit her studio, as well as Priscilla uh, Drez, or Dibbler, Dubler, I'm so sorry, too much coffee, um, who will be here also till the end of the week. Okay, Carrie, over to you. All right, thanks, y'all. Let me just get my screen going here and get myself out of the way. Perfect. Okay, so um, I want to give my thanks to the HCCC for hosting this conversation and acknowledge that I'm on the unceded ancestral land of several indigenous peoples who share this area through their relations and whose descendants continue to resist settler occupation. This is going to be a really quick overview of just a few of my past and current projects, and I really am excited to hear your questions. So as Natalie said, I'm associate professor at San Diego State, where I teach in the jewelry and metalwork program, uh, where you can take surf class for credit. Our dorms feature swimming pools, and we have a Trader Joe's on campus. Um, I'm academically trained as a jeweler and metalsmith, and I use that training to think about how we use objects and how what we keep close to us is a form of human expression. In particular, I'm interested in how jewelry and objects can be used as a way to connect with each other and to build empathetic relationships. So I want to tell you a bit about where I think some of these thoughts formed for me. When I was a kid, I was pretty interested in knowing who I was related to and how. I asked a lot of questions, but found that these conversations most often came up when objects were involved, like who did that belong to? Who did this belong to? A little game I now call object-oriented ancestry. Both of my grandmas chronicled our family histories, one casually through being the steward of objects and the other more formally through photographs and family trees. The objects and photographs substantiated the claims about who my people were, where they came from, where and how they lived and made my connections to them tangible and just more real. So I guess I learned early on that objects can connect us to histories that are hidden. 
my maternal grandma uh, had a lot of things in drawers that she she sort of like thought of them as junk, but not junky enough to throw away. And as a kid, every chance I got, I rifled through those drawers uh, looking for treasures from my familial past. So she had a lot of jewelry too. And this is one of the first pieces of jewelry I remember coveting. It was bought by my grandfather, probably for an anniversary, not too long before he passed away. It's an 18 karat Princess Diana tiara ring by uh, Stuart Devlin for the Franklin Mint made in 1985. And it's such a strange marker of time. It was made to commemorate Diana's and I assume Charles's visit to the Reagan White House where she famously danced with John Travolta. And I just remember loving this ring and thinking that it would look real good on my Barbies. So, um, but I, what I really loved for my grandma's jewelry box were the cameos. I imagined that I was staring at an ancestor, somehow like looking at a true image of the past. Um, there, it was sort of like the photographic and the object evidence coming together uh, in one thing. So fast forward, I started graduate school at the U of I in 2008 with Billie Jean Thidey and learned to um, think deeply about material and its meaning. And the first thing, one of the first things I made was the set of cameos, replacing the shell with bamboo sourced from China that I had laser engraved with the portraits of Tibetan dissidents. And it, they were really protest pieces for me in protest for having uh, being made to use this material, which is a much longer story, but. So then I sourced leather from the border and started trying to imagine what would happen if souvenirs portrayed the realities of the place they were meant to represent. So I made this series of cameos depicting cartel bosses from the warring uh, Mexico, Mexican um, narco organizations. Um, and in 2010, these were exhibited at the Border Art Biennial in El Paso and Ciudad Juarez. And that expanded into a series of souvenir objects. So using the typical items you would find in a souvenir stall at the border as a canvas and replacing the imagery of the Aztec calendar or the man in a sombrero sleeping under a cactus with AP images from the drug war from the maquiladoras and from the femicide coverage. And, and some of this work um, ended up going to Paris and then Bergen for a show curated by Benjamin Lignell and then to New Zealand to the Dow's Art Museum. So in 2013, I was asked by uh, curator Mike Holmes from Velvet Da Vinci to participate in the La Frontera exhibition, which came here to HCCC. I made a full set of cartel operative portraits using DEA and Mexican DOJ's most wanted lists, but um, they were on key fobs instead of on cameos. And I made this uh, custom counter display. So the piece on the left is the, that piece, and it ended up being collected by the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, where it's currently on view in the new Kinder building, which I was so excited to see it. Um, and then I revised the piece for a reboot of the La Frontera exhibition in 2018 for the Museum of Art and Design. So I made several bodies of work this way, sourcing material from a place to tell a story about the place. Whenever possible, I tried to insert myself into the supply chain chain as close as possible to the material's origin. So for this project, I worked two summers on a sheep farm in, on a very small island in, um, in Scotland, and I clipped and processed and spun wool. Um, and that's me on the right clipping sheep with crofters Billy and Marion Muir during their clipping week. Um, and I ended up being, bringing back about 22 kilos of wool, uh, which is a lot. So here's a little academic aside. Um, I was really inspired by artists like Simon Starling, Dario Robledo, Doris Salcedo, Zoe Sheehan Saldana, um, in the um, idea that the artist could somehow be a supply chain guarantor. Um, I was taking a class at the time called Thing Theories uh, with Professor Conrad Bacher, and I was reading Heidegger and Bill Brown and being heavily influenced by Lucy Lepard and Miwon Kwan's ideas about site specificity. So I ended up mashing all of this together in my thesis and creating the term material specificity to refer to what a material brings to the table of making. So back to North Ronald Say, back to the sheep. Uh, in this body of work titled North Ronald Say, I used fleece from that island in Orkney to document the farming practice of this uh, that's unique to that island. And I kind of circled back to the cameo, like very abstracted, 
and constructed these big brooches. Let me turn that off for a second that make a sort of hybrid portrait of the animals and the humans that live on the island and the pieces have an mp3 player embedded that plays the ambient sounds recorded um, that I recorded on the island so that's what you just heard those crazy birds um, singing. So really I was hoping to demonstrate that an object can become a container for memory and that I can pass that memory on to a wearer or a viewer through texture and sound. So in the fall of 2012, I returned to the US after living in the Netherlands for a year to take a job working at SUNY New Paltz in the mid Hudson Valley of New York. And if you've ever been to the riverside of the Hudson, you've probably seen the post industrial ruins, uh, the crumbling chimneys and the beaches covered with industrial waste from factories that produced the materials that built New York City. And for me, these waste materials became a way to explore the region's native colonial and industrial histories. So I worked on this project for nearly two years, making about 50 pieces where I was cutting and carving the antique bricks that I gathered from the riverside and combining them with pearls, which I had inherited from my grandmother and my great aunt. I made some very large sculptural pieces and then I made some more wearable work uh, like these. I was really trying to mash together the form languages of the Algonquin speaking tribes and the fashion of the Dutch colonial period using the native clay and the pearl as symbolic of invasion. So the piece on the far left um, was collected by my hometown museum, the LA County Museum of Art, which I'm very proud of. A selection of uh, from this series is actually currently on view right here at the HCCC until February 26. So I hope you'll come by and see them and say hi. And um, the piece on the right actually will be part of the silent auction for the annual spring luncheon this year. So in 2015, we moved to San Diego, which is, of course, a front line for the ongoing global refugee crises. I was very moved by what was happening and started thinking about topics like security, privilege, and access, who gets to have it, and why. And the more I learned about what was happening, the more I started to shift my own ideas about migration and, uh, and about who is a migrant. Um, Americans, including myself, uh, born here, tend to be somewhat myopic in the way that we think about migration. Migrants are other people and migration is something that happens to and is experienced by someone else, but with very few exceptions, we have all migrated. Some of us have migrated across the world, some of us have migrated across town. Those of us with privilege simply call it something different, but to migrate is to be very human. And so I was really inspired by other artists and, and photojournalists who provoked my own empathetic response. And so the image on the left is by Brian Sokol, a photojournalist from his project, The Most Important Thing. And the image on the right is by Tom Kiefer from his project, El Sueño Americano. Brian Sokol photographed people in refugee camps with their most prized possession. And Kiefer worked in a USCIS detention facility at the, U at the Arizona border as a janitor. And he would gather all the things that had been confiscated from migrants, sort them by type, and then photograph them. So it just so happens that I collect keys and I have a key to every place I've lived since I was 11. And when moving, I experience a sort of separation, uh, irrational separation anxiety that compels me to keep the key just in case I need to go back in for my phone or my wallet or something. Um, so I started by using those keys to make this piece. It's a set of hollow constructed fobs, each with an impression of a key to a place that I've lived. Each time I move, I take a new impression um, of that key and then I add it to the ring. It's a kind of master latchkey kid set that connects me to the ghosts of the places I once knew well but cannot legally <laughs> return to. Another work from that series using keys from jewelry boxes, cedar chests, um, diaries is a kind of chatelaine for sentimentality and fake security. You know those diary locks like they don't actually keep your diary locked very well um so this these works have been shown quite a bit but most notably at the national museum for women in the arts um, in washington dc in the exhibition heavy metal and just a few other pieces from the series exploring different formats including what i like to call pants jewelry which are belt and pocket clips that underscore the utility of these 
as symbols of access and trustworthiness. And it just so happens, coincidentally, that this little brooch on the left is currently up for auction, which it ends tonight at 8 p.m. Central in the Baltimore Jewelry Center's annual Ornamenta auction, along with a host of other impressive pieces of jewelry by well-known and emerging contemporary jewelers. And I encourage you to go check out the auction and support a great cause and get yourself a really great piece of jewelry. I also off offer a custom key service in which I take an impression of your special key and construct a custom pin or necklace or clip um, just for you. And um, so my most recent big project was uh, as the 2019 artist in residence at the New Americans Museum. I spent a few years learning about the history of the region and that I learned that San Diego has the second largest urban population of resettled people. And that since the 1970s, San Diego and Orange counties have been a refuge for people fleeing war, political and religious persecution and displacement caused by climate change. So, but also that San Diego attracts very large populations of domestic migrants um, with the military, giant universities, uh, industry, bi biotech and aerospace and retirement in the sunshine, drawing people from all over. So as resident artist, I invited the public to share an object related to their own family's migration story or their own migration story. Here's an image of our operation of sorts. Um, while I interviewed and recorded each participant's story, my research assistants, Leslie and Rachel, photographed the work and made 3D scans. So we collected about 128 objects and stories over the course of about three months, uh, sorry, five months. And then we 3D printed and assembled 86 of the 128. Thank you to Rachel and Leslie, I could not have done it without them. And then exhibited the clear versions of the originals along with an audio guide that told each person's story. So here's a shot of the installation, which was designed to resemble like a kind of generic blank domestic space. Um, a selection of objects from this project are actually currently on view at the San Diego International Airport in the exhibition Make Yourself at Home. Um, the project was also featured on PBS NewsHour, which blew my mind, and also on NPR's All Things Considered. Um, and there's a link, uh, Natalie's adding links to the, from into the chat, um, if you'd like to watch the PBS clip. Um, you can also download a free PDF of the catalog and use the phone number on my website um, to hear, listen to the stories and the audio guide. Which leads me to my upcoming exhibition, Location Services, at the Craft in America Gallery in Los Angeles. It's a three-person show with my pals Demi Tham Laudis, who is a former HCCC resident, and Matoko Furuhashi, and um, that's happening this summer. So for the past year and a bit, um, I've been working on these ser a series of neck pieces and brooches that think through the sentimentality and preciousness of the objects that we choose to carry when we move and migrate. Each piece is made from leather that's been formed to appear to contain a single object. So I sort of think of them as a non-functional luggage for one special thing. And here are a few of them. Um, on the left, a bell, in the middle, a pearl necklace, and on the right, the teddy bear. So just a tiny bit about this leather forming pra uh, process. Um, I, I use a 3D scan and I take the 3D scan and make that into a CAM file um, for the CNC router. And then each form is cut from a big block of wood. It cuts in a few passes. So first there's a rough cut and then a more refined cut. So that's what you see on the left and right. And then the form is cut free from the block and sanded. And then using millinery and cobbling techniques um, of forming wet leather over the buck, the, the prepped leather is soaked in water and then stretched and nailed to the surface uh, and left to dry. And then I dye it and I cut it out and I build a frame for it and figure out the findings. So um, this is the project that I've been working on during my residency, which is 
in very pretty early stages still. Um, I'm exploring the utility of friendship, how we connect and support each other emotionally, intellectually, and physically, and how we manifest those relationships into adornment or how adornment can kind of embody or symbolize platonic co connection. Um, so last fall, uh, as a resident at the Baltimore Jewelry Center, I did a series of surveys po uh, posing a new question um, to those working around me, as well as on social media each week. And so these are some outcomes that are directly taken from those surveys. So um, this is from a series called Offerings, derived directly from the surveys. Each one offers an experience to another who is at a distance. So um, this one is a telescoping tool that offers the smell of a fresh cut rose. This one offers the sound of the ocean uh, using a shell from the beach in front of my mom's house. And this one offers a magnified view of any small object you choose. You just clip it in the clip. Another series stemming uh, from thinking about how jewelry can connect us both physically and symbolically are these uh, series of chain prototypes, which I'm actively working on right, right now today. Um, riffing off of the well-known broken heart BFF necklace, these chain brooches have a match. And in some cases they can snap back together through the use of embedded magnets. So these are just plastic like um, hardware store chain that I cut up and I'm just trying to think through some possible forms. So first I made a brass version. Um, these are hollow constructed brass, but I figured out that weight was gonna be an issue for both wearability and for using the magnets and you know having a strong enough magnet to get them to snap back together. So um, I'm currently constructing a prototype made from titanium. And this is my mini TIG welder workspace here at the HCCC where I'm currently welding up the links for a few different samples. So I want to just um, end by talking briefly about some collaborations that I do. Um, collaboration has been an important part of my practice for several years now. In 2018, I co-founded the Zine Journal, uh, otherwise known as a Zernal, um, Craft Desert, with my close friend and SDSU colleague, Adam John Manley, who teaches in furniture. In the Zernal, we look at craft in the Southwest through an expanded lens, commissioning articles from craftspeople, artists, scholars, poets, and other magical beings that we come across. So um, you can check out Craft Desert at the links in the comments. And since 2016, I've been working with University of Texas El Paso professor and my BFF, Jess Tolbert. Uh, we co-curate and facilitate exhibitions. Our latest projects were Passenger at Munich Jewelry Week in 2020. And yes, that was right exactly when lockdown happened. And crazily, we made a mobile exhibition and we were driving people around Munich in a passenger van, reading our passenger stories about the work that they were handling right there in the van. So you can check out what we do at Secret Identity um, at the, at our, on our Instagram, which the link is in the chat. And in fall um, of 2020, we made an exhibition called Amend, which commemorated the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment and supported uh, the expansion of voting rights. So we invited 100 jewelers to reimagine the I Voted sticker. Over the course of the two month run, we raised, uh, the work was all for sale. Um, we had an incredible range of jewelers from all levels of career, background, everything. Um, so over the two month run, we sold a lot of work and we raised over $10,000 for Black Voters Matter. So you can still um, get a catalog from this expansive exhibition um, at the link in the chat. There's three versions, an ebook, a hardcover and a paperback. And um, that's all I have. That's my super fast forward version of uh, my what I'm working on and um, I hope you'll come see me in the next week here in Houston um, but I want to really say thanks to the whole crew here at the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft it's been an amazing experience to be here and um, really special thanks to my other my residents partners in crime Joan Nash and Priscilla 
and especially thanks to Natalie for making my time here so great. And I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. And um, I had to put a cowgirl up here because I'm I'm going to end my time here in Houston by going to go Texan Day. So if anybody wants to come, uh, call me. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Carrie. I really enjoyed getting a look back and a, a stronger, uh, longer depth into a deep look into all of your other current bodies of work and hearing about your many, many collaborations, um, which has been great to see and to even have your, your uh, friends visit the craft center during the time you've been here. Um, Carrie, I just had a couple of questions for you. And if anyone has any questions for Carrie as well, please feel free to leave them in the chat. Um, you know, one I wanted to start off with, Carrie, is that you talk about, you know, a lot of your different concepts and various processes that you that you use. And, you know, you talked about trying to use the Holoform links for your latest project, as well as then, um, you know, then now going to hardware store where you're buying found objects and, you know, creating them and, and manipulating them. How do you how do you select those processes? You know, are you thinking about what's best for your concept? You know, maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think like the material, well, often the material comes first, like with the brickwork, I had to, the, the, the material was the, the impetus for the whole project and looking into, you know, what was happening around me environmentally. Um, and so those, pro really the material dictated what I was able to do with it, you know, to cut, I used a tile saw to cut it and I used diamond um, bits to carve it. And really like that was, that was, how, what dictated it. Um, and with like the silver work with the keys, I'm really thinking about um, not necessarily the material properties or the material history as it comes from a mine, but more so our, the cultural history of silver and how we've used it um, as, you know, it's an heirloom, it's a domestic material. Um, we find it in our, well, at least we used to maybe find it in our homes. And there's a history of, of that um, sort of being a, a, a material of trophy. Um, and then, you know, with the plastic prototypes, that's like a convenience thing, right? Like finding something that's kind of the size that you might want to make the thing and trying to quick, very quickly ideate without having to fuss around with the long, long, as anybody out there who's a metals person knows things can take a really long time to make. So sometimes you have to find a thing that can just like help you whip it out as quickly as possible just to get it out of your brain. Um, so, you know, I think like, as I, as I try to figure out these like hollow link snapping brooch things, the material might change. And I mean, right now I've transitioned from brass to titanium just simply for titanium's material properties of weightless or weight less weightness. Um, right where I can make something that's still to scale, like scale, like kind of bigger and, but not have the weight that would make it unwearable. Um, so, but also titanium is kind of interesting. And I've been thinking about this a lot lately. Um, it's obviously it's used in aerospace, right? It's, it's engine parts, it's, um, skins for the space shuttle. You know, they, they use it because it doesn't, it doesn't, um, it doesn't conduct heat, but also, it's a biometal, so we put it in our bodies. So it's it's not only some it's not something that we necessarily associate with on the body, even though we put it through our body, like for piercings. But it's actually something that we in that we use internally. And so maybe there's something interesting there. Um, I don't know. I haven't figured that out yet. But um, it's it's a it's like a, a metal that we keep like extra close, like it's your leg. <laughs> My mom has a titanium knee, you know, so. Yeah, hey, mom. My, my parents too. They're watching too. Hi. They're yeah. really too. Hi, <laughs> They're up there. You know, it seems to me you can really tell the depth of research that goes into your ideas, your processes. And, you know, you think back to like your brickworks and the Hudson River Valley Valley and just the amount of research that you must do about a community and a place and the history of a, of a material before you start a project. Yeah, I, I mean, I definitely, um, I, I, I would, I, sometimes I think of myself as a scholar, even though I don't necessarily um, collate the information in the same way that a scholar would, but there's so much that we soak in and it's not just, it's not just book research or 
um, even like uh, like surveys are kind of like taking a sort of sociological kind of way into to um, to a piece, but we're also like reacting emotionally and collating all of, like all of that together. So yeah, there's it takes me a long time to make things. Well, and then you, you know, you think about uh, the social nature of a lot of your projects and then the social or the, which is a, you know, outward expression, talking to people, and then also the outward expression of wearing jewelry and the jewelry itself on a body. And what does that say about you? And we've been having lots of conversations here at the Craft Center about adornment and wearing jewelry. For those who aren't in Houston, we have the uh, rings at the Helen Drop Collection on view right now. And, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about what does it mean to wear jewelry and what does that signify to, to people on the outside? And you can see how this is all, you know, very interconnected. Definitely. Yeah, so definitely. Speaking of groups, we have a question from Judy, um, who talks about how you, who mentions you are an anthropologist by your work, but she asks, um, do your students get involved in your social practice and have they developed their own social practice as a result? Yeah, um, so uh, yeah, I've, I've had research assistants. So I've had paid student research assistants that work directly on the projects. And, um, and then in, in some of my classes, I've developed projects that ask them to go out and it's design thinking, right? Like you, 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 if you're going to solve a problem, you have to figure out who you're solve, what the problem is and who you're solving it for. And so, yeah, we, I integrate that into, into some of my, my curriculum for sure. Um, and I think that's whether or not that's, I don't know that I had always like thought of it as like an extension of my practice, but I, or my approach to making, I think maybe it's just an important thing for jewelers or any kind of product driven um, craftspeople to learn. Um, so yeah, did I, yeah. Was there a second part to that? <laughs> no, that, that, I think, I think you covered it. Um, we have a, we have another comment and a question from Sandy. Sandy mentions that your work is so powerful and steeped in thoughtful origins. Um, she would like to know if you make things motivated by the joy of making and wearing and wearing jewelry in a more traditional way at some point. Yeah, I've I've been trying to do that more, Sandy, because especially at the Baltimore Jewelry Center, I I, I it wasn't included in the presentation, but I really um, you know a lot of my subject matter is pretty serious and it can be pretty heavy. Um, like the cartel stuff was like it's it's like a it it's it's heavier, you know, um, but thinking about friendship, this newer project, I've really started to try to be more playful and silly, almost like those extending pole things are just like silly, they're ridiculous. And um, I made this like, uh, it was for, um, it was in response to a piece from the Walters Museum, which it's, um, it's a Scottish jewel uh, that is really common from the Victorian era that used a grouse foot, which is like a bird that has like really furry feet. Anyway, it was a byproduct of the hunting culture there. But so I decided to make an American version and I used a rubber chicken foot, like really trying to like laugh at the ridiculousness of that trophy. And um, yeah, I, I, do, I am trying, I'm trying Sandy, I'll get back to you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much, Carrie. If anyone has any additional questions for Carrie, please leave them in the chat and we'll, we can come back around at the end of our conversation and, and pick back up on Carrie. But thank you so much for sharing about your practice and sharing the last three months with you, with us. It's been wonderful to have you at the craft center. And, you know, what I always tell the residents, one of my favorite things about our contemporary society and how um, connected we are in social media is that you're never far out of our reach and out of our community. So, you know, we'll um, be following you back to, to California on the internet. <laughs> Sweet. Thank you, Carrie. Great. Well, next up we have Priscilla Dobler, who has also been here for uh, December, January, and February. You have one week as well to catch Priscilla in her studio. Um, Priscilla is an interdisciplinary storyteller who creates multimedia installations in wood, textile, ceramic, food, and paintings. Her work is focused on reframing the context of America's prideful nationalism and the colonial, colonialization of indigenous cultures while critiquing identity and examining st structures of power in the domestic realm. Priscilla's work has been exhibited internationally and dom domestically. 
Most recently, she has shown at Projects for Empty Space in Newark, New Jersey, the AIR Gallery in Brooklyn, the Consulate of Mexico in Seattle, the Northwest American African Museum in Seattle, NARS Foundation in Brooklyn, 125 Madden Lane in New York, Olympic Sculpture Park in Seattle, and the Orange County Center for Contemporary Art in Santa Ana, California, as well as the Dissenter Gallery in Puebla, Mexico. In addition, she was a 2014 recipient of the grants for the artist projects from the Artist Trust, the 2015 Bailey Award, the 2016 Edwin T. Platt Scholarship, and the 2017 and 2021 Tacoma Artist Initiative Grant Program, as well as the 2021 Puffin Foundation Awardee. She received her MFA from Sculpture from the State University of New, Pulse, or of New York at New Pulse in 2013. And we were also talking earlier about how Carrie um, Ann was a visiting professor while you were there at the same time. So I love having some craft center connections past and present. Um, Carrie will also, or, sorry, Priscilla will also be leading our March 5th Hands on Houston, which I hope she'll tell you a little bit about um, in her presentation as well. So Priscilla, over to you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Um, my name is Priscilla Dobler Sul. I'm from the Yucatan. Um, in my work, I really try to focus on who has the right to appear in public spaces, where, what, and in what time, and in what context to address the issues of political, social, as well as privilege within. The work. Um, I'm really interested in domestic spaces and for from 2016 until 2017 I was doing interviews throughout the United States and in Mexico um, in different areas that I was traveling for residencies or just neighborhoods that I was commuting in, living in. Um, I was really interested in the social political aspect of identity and what identity meant within those spaces and so I started creating these installations where I would re-contextualize um, like the kitchen, the living room, these areas that we gather and we change or do exchanges of dialogue um, culturally and with food as well. And I had interviewed over 60 individuals um, throughout all these different places. And I was just really interested in how to create an installation where I'm using my traditional background, which my family has a history of hammock weaving in the Yucatan and also producing the Anakan threads that were distributed throughout the world um, during the 18th and 19th um, century for the shipping industry. And so I wanted to figure a way how to incorporate the knowledge that has been passed down through my family, but as well as reinterpreting different methods of addressing these social political issues. Um, and so I started creating these installations that were based out of my mother's home and then using projections, audio, video, um, with motion sensors that when a viewer walks into the space, it basically activates the audio and the interviews and allows people to engage and, um, and listen to what is being told as another form of oral storytelling. So what is, what is kept, what is um, interpreted as current, and then what is basically disregarded. Um, from there, I also create these smaller installations where I'm looking at tapestry and I'm looking at garments. And in the Yucatan, we use a lot of ifiles, um, or the women do, and it's um, usually flowered, embroidered, or animal, and it symbolizes like what um, village you're from, but it also symbolizes class um, and gender and um, it can be embroidered with flowers or it can be cross stitch. It all depends on what region you're from. But I was trying to figure out and trying to understand like the history of migration and how as indigenous people, we have migrated throughout the Americas and without borders and what that meant through the cultural exchanges of different tribes. Um, and so I was trying to figure a way of how to incorporate that. And that's where I was like really interested in using these garments that my grandmother, um, that I was given that for my grandmother's but also then using Mayan oral storytelling mixed with English and Spanish. So using this trilingual um, audio that basically as I grew up listening to these different languages spoken in my, in my home, what that meant uh, towards my identity, but also future identities uh, moving forward. So for this piece, um, this is like the rebirth of society. And I'm really interested in reasons why I work with garments a lot is because I'm interested in, um, 
the weight women carry, like the generation of pain, um, knowledge, survival, strength, and how it gets passed down through generations. Um, and this actually, there's a link Natalie will be attaching because this work influenced um, generational root healing, which was an installation that I had created over 300 unfired tiles and had embedded native flowers from the region that I was, I was doing a residency in the Bay Area and led us a hike through this area that was once indigenous lands, but now privatized um, residency spaces for us artists. So again, it's like questioning my own privilege and my mobility in these spaces as well. Um, and then creating a piece that is a dress that basically is biodegradable. So it gives back to land. It has a life, it has this continuous cycle that keeps going. Um, and that's called generational root healing one seed um, a step and Natalie will be attaching that in the link. I'm also interested in looking at objects and um, reinterpreting their meaning. So the Volkswagen is a very symbolic iconic um, vehicle down in Mexico, but the history behind it and when it was created was at the height uh, of the Nazi regime and what was occurring during that time of the genocide. Um, the basic dis uh, displacement and um, erasure of all of these um, people. And so I was interested in how to reinterpret that and look at like the social, political, um, environmental damages that have been created by these big um, manufacturing uh, facilities down in Mexico, uh, the pollution that seeps into the rivers, uh, the health of these people that work. And it's also through the process of colonization that we see that through natural dyes that have occurred with chemicals that have been used. So you see that all the way in India, every India, Africa, Mexico, you know, anywhere you there have been um, colonization uh, that has occurred and exploitation of goods and materials. You see the violation of the human body of these people, their rights, um, their lands, their waters. And so I was interested in how to reinterpret the Volkswagen and create a dialogue that addresses these um, issues and how the, um, Industrial Revolution has destroyed the textile um, textile production throughout all these other countries. And I created this life-size Volkswagen. It was a two-year process of trial and error. I had an amazing woodworker helping me out and um, just you know weaving this and talking about this and working through it, just the labor that was involved. A lot of I realized a lot of my work is based around labor. And I had, I'm very fortunate that a lot of my weavings are very um, community-based. So my family, my aunts, um, cousins, nieces, friends, they come and help me weaving. So for this piece, I had one cousin underneath the car, I was on top, another one on the side, and we were just literally throwing the thread back and forth, um, weaving consistently and discussing some of these issues. So for there, this one has an audio component as well. Most of my work is motion sensor and has some type of element of audio. Um, and this one uh, talks about like the industrial revolution, but it also talks about um, just like issues that are currently happening right now with climate crisis and um, the displacement of land and how some of our materials that we use are still contributing to a lot of these indigenous and black struggles throughout the world. So that's what I try to create in a lot of this work. Um, this is some of the newer series that I've been working on. I've been really interested in uh, domestication of plants um, and the extinction or the destruction of native plants. And a lot of this work was influenced, um, you know, coming home to my mother or come, going back to my mother's house. Every time I would go in there, it's like this poof of chili peppers, like the smoke. And she's right in there grilling, firing, you know, and she can handle it. And for me, it's like, how did my body become so disassociated to a plant that is so rich in our history of our Mayan culture and how we consume and, you know, just like that whole history of it. So I was interested in how like scent can trigger um, memory. And a lot of this embroidery, as you can see all around here, is again, creating these imagery, these stories, um, but also using scent to activate another element. So it's not only what we see and hear in my installations, but also how we smell. So a lot of all of these threads and this tapestry and then these chairs were all infused with um, essential oils of cacao, coffee, vanilla, um, the chili peppers that I had been growing, uh, growing and then I hydrated and grind up and then infused with everything. 
So then it triggered some other element of how we view art and how we experience a whole element using all of our senses. Um, I truly believe that our bodies, our skin read, um, you know, can read work so much more than just visually seeing it. I, I wanna be allow the people to have the full experience um, these chairs also had conductive wire threads that basically were woven in. So when you sat, it um, created, it played the um, audio. So there's an audio component, again, a story told in Spanish, English, and Yucatec Mayan. Um, then that basically allows the viewer to not, again, not only see and smell, but also hear and feel and touch. Um, and what was really interesting for me is because these chairs are the modern, design and woodworkers credit Clara um, Porres, and she's a Cuban um, designer that had gone to Mexico and did all of this research. But what they don't understand is that this chair already existed. This chair was already had existed prior to her redesigning and reinterpreting it. Um, and it was based off of the Spanish X-frame chair combined with the pre-Columbian ritual seats that were known as dojos. And for me, it's like really interesting when that history gets ignored because that history of cultural exchange that occurred or just like any, like if you look at the silk thread, um, you know, like the silk road and that history, like everything gets dis disregarded. There's a history of um, indigenous groups from Mexico traveling all the way up to Turtle Island to do all of these like uh, cultural um, exchanges of material. So for me, it's always interesting when everything gets disregarded and people only focus on one element or one artist, you know, contributing to that. So in that sense, I wanted to reinterpret how these chairs were made and start bringing these elements of um, weaving and these patterns of geometric forms that were brought in. Uh, the Yucatan has a lot of Lebanese influence. So I wanted to bring a way to how to activate and talk about those cultural exchanges. And even our food has switched around to a lot of Lebanese um, uh, plates. And then also a way to activate the floor, like activate the tiles. How do you activate other spaces? Um, and then this is a detail of just what some of the tapestry looks like. And this is a dancing jaguar or jaguar. This is the woven patterns. Um, and then this is Tea Party. Uh, this is an installation I did with my collaborative partner, Maureen McCourt. And we were interested in um, the history of tea and the imagery and representation of tea, as well as women's or and uh, not only women's labor, but also the labor industry of like um, serving people that clean, cook, and the disregard of that action or that labor. Um, so we created this installation where um, you, you can't really see, but all of this has been uh, printed, relief printed on this fabric. And then I created this furniture design and the, the slip cast, all of these tea uh, sets. And we served uh, tea for a whole weekend. Um, and it was interesting because we would have these dialogues and these conversations where people would ask us, okay, so you've already created all the work. Where is the labor that you're talking about? Without understanding that us serving, washing all of the dishes, all of the cups and everything to reserve and heat up, that is the labor that gets disregarded. The service industry gets disregarded. And it was really critical uh, during COVID to see how people were just demanding for you know restaurants to stay open. And again, it's like the, the ignorance and um, lack of acknowledging that we as humans need to be working as um, a community to protect each other and not just for our own individual um, consumption or our, our own needs. And the conversations were really interesting. We, um, we had so many families and different ages of um, people coming in and out um, engaging with this work. Um, a lot of my food is based around, uh, sorry, a lot of my work is based around food. And for this one, I, again, look at objects that we use on a daily basis. So the tortilla press, um, and I reinterpret that and I create these pewter molds, um, these, sorry, these molds that are then cast in pewter that are food grade. So then I can relief print onto the masa and serve people. So then there's this act of serving and community engagement and uh, food and talking about food inequality. Um, and through this process, it also talks about like the history of the object and the history of uh, printmaking, like who has, who have the history of reading and access to these um, publications or these writings and who didn't um, also um, 
the history uh, again of the I don't know um, ignoring the labor that is involved in the um, migrant workers who pick the food and who literally are out there every day in horrible conditions getting paid so poorly while we are able to consume all of this. And these are just different imagery of um, every time I do a performance, I've been doing these performances since 2011. It's always a new set of tortilla presses that I create different shapes, different designs and a different story that I'm, I'm incorporating to tell. Um, currently, right now, I have been working on new methods. Um, I've been doing a lot of research. I do uh, a lot of my work that I focus on is usually based around something that I read through my research and want to further investigate. So a while ago, I don't know, a couple of years ago, I was just reading about how much knowledge has been destroyed through um, colonization in the Yucatan, Yucatan particularly. Um, we had over 20,000 sculptures um, and, and objects that were destroyed by the priest um, and manuscripts, writings. So I was always interested in like, what was the representation of like queer identity and what was the representation of us as one within our own ecosystems? Like how do we relate to one another? And I look at mythological creatures as a way of like describing currently what's happening in our society right now, but also future what we want to see and how we want that strength to grow for our future ancestors. And so I just like to create creatures that are hybrids of different types of species and humans all mixed together to retell these stories and these different types of um, forms of being able to tell a story. <laughs> Uh, so these are just some of the ones that I've been working on, and I'm working on a couple right now here at the residency that haven't been fired, so I've um, been busy with that. And at the residency, I've also been working on creating vessels that have been adapted and formed only to my body um, as a way of like, how do we protect our knowledge, our ancestral knowledge, but also how do we give our knowledge through these acts of labor of serving? Um, and all of these vessels that I've been creating have literally been adapted for me to do a performance in different um, angles and elements that they will be all serving some form of either uh, chocolate or some type of other um, drinks that we use through ritual and cleansing. And this is like just one of the designs. Um, I always think again, like this is like seeds in the middle. And I think of like, all of these ecosystems that how we have to literally respect and acknowledge every single insect um, from insects to plants to anything just for us to learn how to live with one another. So a lot of my work that I've been evolving includes that um, as well as I was talking a little bit earlier about the and again uh, the threads that my family produced um, in the Hacienda Picopo. And I will be leading a workshop here with Hands on Houston, teaching people how to do dyes and the history of Anakin as well, which I have been using in a lot of my embroideries right now. Um, and that's it. Wonderful. Thank you, Priscilla. Um, if you have any questions for Priscilla, please um, leave them in the chat. I have a couple to start us off with, but if you have any, please drop them in. Um, Priscilla, it was so wonderful to hear more about your practice and um, your, again, it reminds me with Carrie as well, you both do this deep dive into research um, that really shows up in both of your works and that you can, you can tell you've really researched and have really been thinking um, about the materials, about the processes. Um, but I also wanted to ask you about community as well. You know, you mentioned working with the community performances, and I wondered if you could talk about that um, that connection and why it's so important for you to to have these um, interactive um, installations. Um, yeah, thank you. I forgot to say also thank you to HCC just for this amazing opportunity and my cohort of amazing artists, Carrie Ann, um, Joan, and Nash. And carry on, and I just love your work, by the way. But yes, um, I just think it in general. I think for me, I like creating platforms. Um, I'm very. Um, I grew up in a very 
prominently activist household where we had to learn quickly about inequality and how to um, fight for justice. You know, if it had to be in with food security, but also just like, um, you know, redlining that was occurring in neighborhoods that we grew up in and things like that. We just constantly were aware of the struggle um, as children. And going back and forth, like my mother made sure we knew about the mobility of like how we can't just enter any community and think that, hey, we're here, let us, you know, we have to understand and have these dialogues and communications and um, understand that each area and each region has a different struggle, but it's still the same. The black and brown indigenous communities are still struggling in so many same particular ways. So for me, it's important as an artist to be able to come to these spaces and not just take up but be a part where, okay, how can I create a platform to also, um, it's not give a voice because everybody has a voice, but it's give a platform where it's like your work will shine as well. And Natalie, we talk about this. We talk about the artisans in Mexico and how I'm constantly fighting for this and like trying to find ways that they can get recognition instead of this exploitation that occurs when American artists or European artists go to these Oaxaca, go to Yucatan, go to all these other regions just to learn the technique and then, or, you know, use the labor and then bring the work back. Um, so for me, it's like finding ways of addressing those issues. And it's critically important in my work because my background is, my, my relationship to textile is di different from my mother's and my, my female relatives because it's such a different generation, but also the privilege of not having to grow up in Mexico and use it as a sort of economic means of survival versus me he, being here doing it as a means of just artistic expression. So in a way I have an uh, obligation to use that platform to address these issues. And that's why it's important to be involved in the community. Well, you know, building off of that, um, so we're having a workshop with Priscilla next week on February 26th. It's a responsive ceramic workshop. Fortunately, it's full, but you can email us to be on the wait list. Um, but since it, it is full, I wondered, Priscilla, if you could talk a little bit about what that workshop will be about and your reasoning behind it and share those, those goals, because I think it really plays into your work, especially the large vessels um, that are responsive to your body that you showed at the end of your talk and share that with the community. Yeah, so it's going to be a workshop out of clay, um, teaching people how to make vessels that only adapt to their body. So again, it's like when we think of how we serve and how, um, you know, people are serving us consistently in like restaurants and stores, anywhere we go. Um, it's about understanding like how our labor is really um, interconnected, interwoven together but also how we need to be able to protect. I am getting to the point where I'm so tired of having to constantly educate people about my indigenous background or our struggles, uh, the land reform issues that we're still having in Mexico, privatize, privatizing lands that are still indigenous that are being wiped away. So for me, it's a way of like how to show people like our labor is an act of love and knowledge that we pass down through generations. And it's something that we protect and we hold to our bodies that are so deep and dear. So it's like teaching people how to make their own and what that means as they pass on, that on to their next generation. Um, to heal that generational trauma, it, you have to think of the past, the present that we are, and the future as we move forward. Priscilla, you just keep leading me into all of my questions. It's like you're reading my mind. Um, I was in your studio the other day and we were looking at some of the new sculptures that you're working on, which you showed some previous um, renditions of your sculptures. And you were talking about, um, you know, these, these mythological creatures that do come from, you know, Mayan backgrounds and Mayan figures, but also you're creating new ones, you're creating new um, combinations. And you said something, and I'm going to paraphrase that you were creating ancestors or stories of now that we would look back on or look to in the future. And I thought that was really poignant to think about our future communities. And can you, could you maybe, you know, clue everyone else in on the conversation we were having and talk about those, those future, um, those future ancestors that you're depicting? Yes. Um, so for me, I'm always like, well, what is, what does mythology mean? Like, how do we interpret that? I always think of it as like something that's currently happening right happening right now. As, you know, these stories were created to discuss some type of political social event that was occurring at that time. So, one of the figures I cre I'm creating is um, a figure that was basically she was very sexual and she lured men. So there's like this fear of female sexuality, and so 
as a queer artist um, growing up with at a time frame when there was like so much homophobia and so much like hatred I just remember being called Pocahontas consistently um, and then just like all of these negative terms around uh, gender identity and sex sexuality I just like want it's taken me a point in my career to get to where I am. And I wanna figure out like how to create these future ancestors that are gonna be so powerful in their, in their essential being and who they are, but are also, like I said, hybrids of these animals that we need to continue on. We can't continue extincting because as these animals and plants, especially plants are dying off, that's part of who we are. That's part of our past ancestors that are being erased. So I'm creating these figures that are pushing forward of how we want our future ancestors to be. Again, I'm playing around with like, what did, what do these objects look like? The 20,000 that were destroyed in like, you know, a matter of time that was like, I don't know, the article that I was reading, it was like the journals, it's like, and one day they were just fire and break and destroy everything. So I was like, okay, so what were those figures for queer identity people, like queer identifying people, like what do we want to use and push forward um, so that we continue to heal as we are moving on? Thank you for sharing that, Priscilla. Well, I wanna thank you all for being with us this afternoon and both to Carrie Ann and Priscilla for taking such a insightful and wonderful look at your work. Um, I also wanna mention, as Priscilla mentioned in her um, presentation that on March 5th from 11 to one, um, we're having our first Hands on Houston, which is our family day, our monthly family day. We're back in person and Priscilla is um, kind enough to lead us through an activity of dying Heineken with Cochineal and then learning how to braid the rope. And we'll be having you know, some conversations around the history of the fiber and the history of Cochineal as we um, dive into this family activity. So it's for all ages as well. So if you're in Houston and want to um, come learn a little bit more and explore with us, please join us um, on March 5th here at the Craft Center. Thank you both so much. It's been wonderful to get to know you over the past three months and get to know your practice. Um, we, you know, this is the, the residency is the heart of the craft center. As many people know, this is our 20th year and the craft center really started with residents at their heart and continue to be so. And so through residents like you and conversations like this, you know, we can create to continue to create a craft community that's expanding of what we talk about as, as craft. Um, for everyone in Houston, you have about a week to come visit both Priscilla and Carrie in their studios. I highly recommend it to see what they're working on. Um, and we will be having another a resident artist talk in March on two of our other current residents that both Priscilla and Carrie have mentioned, Nash Quinn and Joan Brown. And Nash and Quinn have been actually making some of their own collaborations between metal and, and um, ceramic. So please tune back in, in in May to hear more about what they are up to. Again, thank you. Please come visit us, come visit the residents, and we appreciate your support of the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft. Thank you, everyone.